Guy and I are both so steeped in these movies from our childhood. We were interested in harking back to the sort of genesis of spy movies. It's so second nature to us. We were fluent enough in the language of those films to be able to take that language and put a little twist on it, to put, a, put our own little slang and our own idiom on it. I like to make movies that I want to watch. I want to create a world in which I don't care whether it's authentic or not. It just needs to be authentic enough to me for me to believe that it's authentic. After that, it's a fantasy. There's something very modern about the feel of the style of the 60s. To me, it's the coolest era walking onto a set in the 60s and seeing everybody wearing real clothes. Italy in the 60s is quite fabulous. Italians were quite out there with their fashion. We need two purses, please, and every day in clutch, and grab that belt. The costumes on this movie are absolutely amazing. Joanna, our costume designer, has done an amazing job. Everybody looks good, whatever they do, whether they're washing up or chasing a car, they still look brilliant and smart. It was a higher priority, wasn't it? Natty dressing, sharp dressing. Joanna, she was the first one that I met after Guy and Lionel. I came in for a few fittings, you know, early on, and it's a great way to kind of get into character. You look important, or at least your suit does. You know, you put it on and you feel Napoleon Solo. Allow me. The character of Solo is very considered, and he sort of has manufactured himself into this person, which is a sort of front, really. And he is all about vanity and the projection of his appearance. And he is incredibly considered, so he looks well turned out as a sort of proper gentleman at all times. Great. Joanna is such an incredibly talented designer and so collaborative. We really sort of put our brains together and just created this wardrobe. I started to chat with her and we saw one picture and what if that dress that I just tried, what if you, I love that back. It was the most amazing dress. I have these incredible costumes in this film. And they were very, obviously, very informing as an actor to wear. Victoria is sort of slinky, beautiful, kind of couture, but more in her own individual way. She's a sort of match for Solo. She's considered super vain. It's all about projection of her image, super sexy. She's a snake. She wants to snare people into her lair. Sleep well, Napoleon. Ilya is much more laid back, so he's suede jackets and cord jackets and slacks, as they call them in America, which was definitely the thing I pulled out from Ilya Karyakin in the TV show. That bow tie doesn't work with that suit. This is one of the few times I actually get to wear a suit. Other than that, I'm in like a turtleneck and a suede coat. So this actually breathes much better right now, so I'm enjoying it. I get to be a child and I get to time travel. So you come out on the street and everything's just changed. You have those 200 extras dressed up. It is such a kick. The period is so fun, you know. Help yourself to a drink. Period movies involve world creation, completely recreate a new world. There may be the exterior of a building you can adjust, but everything is new. The details of every interior, the telephones, the cut of the suits, the style of the shoes, the style of the hair. Everything is just it's very specific to a particular period. And to, for it to really feel real and authentic, you have to get it right. Where are we going? The same place every architect goes when they visit the Rome. To see the sights. I must say, when I shoot a film, it always helps to be on location. The look of the movie has changed so drastically, dependent upon where we are in the movie, because we've been in East Berlin, West Berlin, and Italy, and of course, secret underground layers and all sorts. We start in East Berlin, and it's what I call concrete colors. So everything's very cold and hard, pretty dismal, really. When we get to West Berlin, that's the sort of the beginning of the opening up and the dynamics of trend emerging through. And then we get to Italy. It's all warms and golds. And we were particularly inspired by the Italy of La Dolce Vita, which I think probably is the most glamorous aspect of the 60s. In Italy, you get all that lovely architecture, which is Mussolini and 30s. We have all these period buildings there, and it's really gorgeous. We were looking for places that had an edge to it as well, so that it had a style, and also to look glamorous. So that's why we ended up near Naples. So this is the uh, layer underneath the Vinciguerra Castle. I think the most wondrous thing in Naples that we found were these tunnels, which were just incredible. They'd been carved out by people. They were massive. How do they get out there? When we had the illustrations, I was like, well, there's a, a ton of rock underneath that castle to get to the top. You can either walk up the ramp on the outside of the castle, or you go through the World War II storage areas, and that's what we did. 
A lot of the things we were shooting in Italy were often boat-related scenes. I actually spent quite a lot of this film on a boat. The stipulation from the very beginning is trying to, you know, selling the period with the vehicles. If you get a period vehicle today, they're either completely falling apart or they're these absolutely gorgeous trophy cars that are being meticulously maintained. Obviously, you want something in between. You want something that looks like it's actually been used at the time. Do you mind terribly if I borrow your car? Every Wartburg we had in the film was almost a barnyard find. So it was rusty, it was an old pale blue, brown, green color, falling apart interior, exterior. They needed love. We completely gave them a new life. All the bodywork was done, seals, interior headlining, seats relined, door cards, carpets, dashboard. They were all built from scratch, pretty much. All we used were the bodies. Great fun to drive vintage old Alfa Romeos and all these old beautiful old race cars on the track. And it's a lot of fun. It's, it's visceral, you know? Look at this. This film I'm using has been treated to be sensitive to gamma radiation. These blurred lines here means they've been in close proximity to radioactive material in last 24 hours. The technology in the original Man for Uncle series is all about being futuristic and cutting edge and trying to predict what the future will be. The technology in our film is an attempt to be grounded, to be faithful to the period, and to give today's audience a flavor of what it must have been like in that time so that everything that takes place in our story makes sense. We're showing the root story. So the gadgetry that we know from the series hasn't been developed yet for the spies. What is it? Super hardened boron sharpened with a CO2 laser. The gadgetry that, that Ilya and Solo have at this point is actually the KGB stuff and the CIA stuff. Try and keep it smooth without yeah, juggling. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you don't, yeah, that's right. It's, it's smooth. smooth. you go, then. Yeah. yeah. Seal to laser. Coming? It's a lot of gadgets. <laughs> I say that it's a tracking device. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, that's a tracking device. It's a tracking device. He's probably out there in the woods. Watching us right now. All the little details that all of us come up with will transport us into a sort of magical place, which will feel that much more real because of those details. It takes you with you uh, to, to develop things and to, to do things you, you wouldn't expect. Yeah! It's the laying the groundwork for hopefully more of these that we can do that people will enjoy. It's just being good fun.